Hello, I'm Dr. Joel Galfand. I'm a professor of dermatology and epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm here uh, discussing an encore presentation of uh, a talk I gave at the late breaking research session at the American Academy of Dermatology meeting in March 2023, San Diego, California. And this was the uh, first presentation of the light treatment effectiveness study uh, data uh, that just read out uh, from this large pragmatic clinical trial. Uh, these are my disclosures, which are large, largely not really relevant to the study that we're doing here. Uh, the study was funded by the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. Uh, Davlin provide home phototherapy machines for the study and shipping for the devices. Uh, the funders and Davlin had no role uh, otherwise in the study. Uh, we designed this, executed, analyzed it, on, and are reporting it now. All right, so in 2024, uh, we have a lot of ways of managing psoriasis, particularly moderate to severe disease. But I would argue that ultraviolet phototherapy remains a very important part of our therapeutic armamentarium. And I think the data from the study will sort of prove that. But before, before we get into the study itself, uh, some recent literature has been published in the last couple of years suggests that number one is office phototherapy is uh, dramatically uh, more cost effective than biologics, costing less than 10 to 100 times what biologics cost for the management of psoriasis. In the US in uh, 2023, we spent $27 billion on pharmaceutical management of psoriasis, and therefore there's a real need to figure out ways of bending this cost curve. Second, in randomized placebo control trials that we have done, looking at the cardiovascular effects of our therapies, we actually showed that office phototherapy works about as well as adalimumab, but actually achieves better patient reported outcomes, uh, including uh, better improvement in overall pain uh, and overall well-being. Uh, so this suggests that phototherapy works just as well as one of our major biologics. The other thing is that from this data, we showed that phototherapy may have some cardiovascular benefits. It, it lowers IL-6, which is known to be causally related to cardiovascular disease, and improves HDLP, so there's some metabolic benefits. These are things we don't see with a lot of our other therapies, like acinumab. Acinumab don't really affect IL-6, a critical inflammatory pathway for cardiovascular disease. Another recent clinical trial done by Novartis uh, found that in a head-to-head -head comparison, those on office phototherapy had much better safety compared to those in cyclokinumab with no infections-related treatment compared to a 14% rate in those on cyclokinumab. This is placebo-controlled. This is a randomized controlled data, I should say, not placebo-controlled, highly statistically significant. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize, I think our treatments for psoriasis are quite safe and well-tolerated, but we know that some of our patients are really concerned about infections or want non-pharmaceutical management of the disease, and therefore, phototherapy plays an especially important role uh, in that circumstance. All right, so why do we do the light study? Uh, so this photograph is a, is a picture uh, of our team with our stakeholders involved in the study. We first surveyed thousands of patients and over and about 1,000 dermatologists in the U.S. and determined that phototherapy remains a preferred treatment, especially at home by patients, but that inconvenience and co-pays are major barriers for patients accessing office phototherapy. And also about 90% of U.S. counties don't even offer a dermatologist that has phototherapy in their practice. And so we're not well geographically distributed. The lack of U.S. data on home phototherapy and psoriasis has resulted in many insurance companies not covering home phototherapy and many providers uncertain about prescribing it. And so the goal of LIGHT is really to address that um, that a gap in knowledge, if you will, in terms of how well this uh, treatment works in the U.S. population. It's unique in the field of dermatology, particularly U.S. dermatology, where the study was driven by patients from inception. They're the ones who decided that we should pursue this line of work, helped us apply for the grant, helped us with design a study, have overseen the study and, and a part of our dissemination efforts now. Our primary hypothesis is to determine that phototherapy in the office uh, is probably works just as well as phototherapy at home, or I should say the other way around. Phototherapy at home works just as well as it does in the office. Uh, the scientific term is called non-inferior. And our primary endpoints were twofold, being clear, almost clear from the physician perspective, having small to no effect on quality of life on the DLQI, the patient perspective. Those are co-primary endpoints. Again, unique in the field of dermatology because this is a patient-centered trial, and therefore a patient endpoint ends up being primary as well. 
study is a pragmatic trial designed to reflect how we actually practice dermatology in clinical practice. So the criteria reflect that. They were 12 or older, had plaque or gutate psoriasis, and the clinician felt like they were a candidate for phototherapy at home or in the office. And the patient agreed and was willing to be randomized and accept either assignment. The patients had to be new or established patients in that clinical practice. These routine patients being recruited at the point of care. And there were no washouts for any other therapy except phototherapy itself. So patients could be on topicals or biologics or pills. It didn't matter because this is a pragmatic trial. We're reflecting how we actually practice medicine. Uh, again, this is a non-inferiority trial. Our, our margin is 15%. Um, that's based on uh, margins that are used to establish biosimilarity by the FDA. So we think it's a reasonable estimate. And to give you a sense of how we interpret this, if you got results one, two, or three, you would conclude that office, I'm sorry, home phototherapy is non-inferior to office phototherapy. If you've got number four, you would find that things are uninterpretable because the CI crosses a margin non-inferiority. And if you found number five, you would conclude that, in fact, office-based office phototherapy works better, and therefore home phototherapy is not non-inferior. This is the schema, how the study was designed. Again, people were enrolled at the point of care. Our goal was to enroll 350 patients in skin types 1, 2. That's very fair skin. 3, 4, which is uh, medium complected skin, and 5, 6, which is very darkly pigmented skin. So we could prove non-inferiority within skin type. Okay, Because you imagine a person with very fair skin, maybe they'll burn more at home because it's less titrated specifically to their skin type, um, and therefore maybe it won't work as well at home. Or, or maybe if people have very darkly pigmented skin, maybe the treatment times take too long at home because you're talking about eight or nine bulbs compared to what we do in the office, which is roughly 36 to 40 bulbs. Okay. Uh, they're randomized one to one. Uh, the primary endpoint is roughly 12 weeks after randomization. Uh, much, virtually all the data we collected was from routine clinical practice or from the machines themselves, because the machine has what's called a dosimeter. Uh, and that is something where the patient has to fill out a survey on the machine so the machine knows what dose to give them in terms of whether they had uh, a burn and how long it lasted from the last treatment. Uh, the DLQI surveys were uh, completed on the patient's cell phone. So very simple data collection uh, in order to embed this in routine patient care. All right, this is the baseline demographics. Um, uh, 390 in office, 393 in home, 783 overall. They are uh, middle-aged in their late 40s, uh, fairly equal representation of men and women, uh, fairly diverse patient population relative to SRISA studies, uh, we filled enrollment in skin types 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, we only had 83 patients in skin type 5, 6 at that time, and therefore we, we stopped enrollment, recognizing that it would take too long to get to 350 patients in that, in that uh, subgroup. Uh, they tend to be obese on average. They were severely affected by psoriasis. The DLQI score was 12. That's a bad as you'll see in any clinical trial. They had moderate to severe disease based on global assessment and PSA. They had a big burden for doing office phototherapy. Travel times to and from phototherapy on average were estimated to be about 60 minutes. Copays were averaged to be estimated to be about $20 a treatment. These patients had longstanding psoriasis. They were heavily pre-treated with oral or biologic medications as well as phototherapy itself. And 12% of patients were currently taking oral or biologic therapy during the course of the study. So this gets back to what I said about earlier. Phototherapy remains very important in modern-day management psoriasis. You see a lot of these patients previously tried and failed systemic agents or are currently on these systemic agents and still need phototherapy and had pretty severe disease. All right, these are the primary endpoint data. So uh, the response rate in home on clear, almost clear, is roughly 33%. DLQI being uh, no to minimal impact on health-related quality of life, 52%. Uh, in both cases, the home group uh, did better than the office group, uh, numerically speaking, and based on a 95% CI. And the p-value for non-inferiority is quite extreme. So we've definitively proven non-inferiority of home treatment compared to office treatment based on these metrics. When you look at skin type now, we also have proven non-inferiority for skin type 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6. And I'll point out that even though we did not fully enroll skin type 5, 6, the benefits in terms of response difference were most significant in, in the home group compared to office groups. We, we had statistical significance of non-inferiority uh, in this subgroup as well, despite not filling enrollment in that strata. 
Uh, now, a lot of this was driven by the fact that patients were able to adhere to home phototherapy much better than office phototherapy. They had more treatments. They were more likely to accept randomization to that arm. So about 80% of people who got randomized to home had at least one treatment compared to about 60% were randomized to office who got at least one treatment in the office. And then, you know, ideally people should get about two treatments a week. And here you see uh, roughly half of patients uh, who had at least one treatment uh, had uh, 50, you know, met uh, this, this threshold of two treatments a week compared to the 16% uh, who were randomized to office. So very hard for patients uh, at, at, in the office to adhere to a, to a, a robust regimen of, of phototherapy. Uh, not surprisingly, then, more treatments at home. You have higher doses, higher cumulative doses, higher percentage of treatments with erythema lasting more than 48 hours or being persistently read. Um, when we looked at how clinically significant this was uh, amongst the patients who had persistent erythema, when we asked them the DLQI question, how itchy, sore, painful, or stinging has your skin been? Um, we found that the majority of these patients really had no symptoms at all. And, and no patients stopped phototherapy in either arm uh, due to having problems with uh, burns related to treatment. So th it's very well tolerated therapy. Uh, and, and part of the reason why you see more erythema at home was that they're, they're receiving more treatments. They have the opportunity to uh, get past the MED. All right. Uh, we looked at serious adverse events. These were very low in both groups. None were considered to be related uh, to treatment. We did a number of sensitivity analyses. Um, we looked at different ways for having missing data. You know, our primary endpoint, if the patient did not complete their follow-up visit or didn't fill out their survey, they were considered to be a non-responder. That has a very conservative way of estimating uh, response in patients because a lot of these patients are probably doing fine, but just didn't follow up uh, for in the office or doing uh, their surveys. Uh, but when you look at different ways of missing data, the results are basically the same. If you look at varying levels of compliance, uh, the results are fairly similar as well. Uh, and then if you look at people who never had phototherapy in the past, the results are basically the same as our primary analysis. This suggests that uh, there should be no reason to insist on a course of office phototherapy before allowing someone to try home phototherapy. We also have the people who are adherent to treatment. I talked about that earlier. You know, patients who had at least, on average, two treatments a week during the course of the study. And here, remarkably, about 60% of patients achieved clear, almost clear skin. Nearly half achieved what would be the equivalent of a posi uh, 90. So this puts it in the, the category of, of highly, more highly effective biologics, like secukinumab, for example, amongst people who are adherent. And so that tells you in a, in a difficult-to-treat patient population of the study that patients could do quite well when they're adherent to therapy. And of course, they're much more likely to be adherent if they're doing it at home. So these are our conclusions. Uh, home phototherapy, clearly non-inferior to office phototherapy across all skin types and for both primary outcomes, a patient-reported one, physician-reported outcome. Uh, and both home and office phototherapy have excellent effectiveness and safety in the real-world setting. These data clearly support the use of home phototherapy as a first-line treatment for psoriasis, including those with no prior phototherapy experience. And the next stage of this work is really to make home and office phototherapy more available for patients who have psoriasis. I just want to acknowledge uh, that running uh, a 42-site multicenter trial of an academic program takes a lot of work. Uh, I want to acknowledge my, our patient stakeholders, our payer stakeholders, the dermatology experts involved in this, involved in this study, uh, all of our site investigators, and of course, uh, my research lab uh, and family uh, who are very supportive of me doing this type of work. Uh, and also very grateful, of course, for the support we've received from our research partners and PCORI. Um, I, I encourage you to reach out to me if you have any questions. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, where I'm at Dr. Joel Gelfand. Uh, or uh, track me down via email. Thanks so much for listening to this presentation, which is an encore presentation of AAD Waybreaking Research.